Okay, great. So I'm going to reiterate uh, some of Dr. Fokum's points and try and make some connections in a few cases both to particular um, you know, parts of species description, so how you actually, and, and like my first example, see some of the requirements actually in a species description just to see how they're presented, as well as highlight a few other things that are really very much more specific to just describing a species and not really dealing with higher level systematics, but just the rules related to species and trying to summarize them. Eric actually covered a lot of them. But I've written out some other definitions and things so that when you get this as a PDF, you can have it for your reference. And so we'll, we'll make this quick, but just to drive home some points. And this will all be focused on zoological taxonomy, although a lot of the principles are you know, similar between taxonomy for other, other organisms. So to make a new species a, an available name, and I'll get to the difference between availability and validity in a second. To make a new species name that you describe today, new and valid, um, what it has to appear in, or uh, sorry, to make it available, the name has to first appear in a scientific publication. And so the examples that I'm giving here, and I'll give a little bit of examples tomorrow, are just mostly from my own publications, just to show you, you know, how I basically satisfy these rules in making this, writing the species descriptions. Because this is something that, of course, you know, Rafe and I in town, we're all concerned about following the rules also in order to make the names available and useful. So here is a paper uh, that we described a new species from Cameroon in Nigeria. It was published, you can't read it here, but it was published in the journal Herpetologica, which is a, a journal focused on amphibians and reptiles. It has to meet the criteria for a new name. This is Arthroleptus palava, which is a, um, is a noun in apposition. So it's actually, you specify in the description that it's a noun. Uh, so in this case, I didn't have to Latinize it. And I've actually done this with a lot of local language names. For instance, we've named things from Mount Oku that are in the local language Oku. Um, in order to you know, have this local connection with our species diversity, we have species that are found on only one mountain. We're actually able to use local language, local place names, and the way that we can not have these really gross, terrible looking Latinized versions of local place names is to treat them as nouns. So here is that. And really important is you have to specify that it's a new name. And so in this, uh, different journals sometimes have different formats for this. But in this journal, uh, it's indicated here as spa-nav. You know, it's a new species. And the reason that this is important is imagine that you just saw a name somewhere in a paper, right? Rafe wrote a name that he thought was, you know, the name of this species, but it turns out that's not, it's not an available name. There's never been a description of that. So just because you write the name somewhere doesn't mean that it's now a new species name. So it has to satisfy criteria. So one of those is that it's formed properly, and Dr. Foka mentioned a few of the criteria for that. Another is that it's actually specified it's a new name. You have to specify type specimens. In older literature, say pre-1930s, there can be cases in which it's still an available name, even though they didn't actually cite a specimen. So we have examples of this in herpetology, for instance, work by uh, Dumarel and Bibron, who were working in Paris, who didn't there's no indication necessarily in some of these papers of what the specimens are or even what institution they're in. But what has happened over time is that the rules have changed. And normally what we um, apply are the rules up until this point in time, say 1930, you know, the names are available based on criteria that are less rigorous as they are after 1930. And then after 1999, they're actually even more rigorous and so we require all of these things now. So now you must specify at least, the very least, a holotype specimen. You can specify syntypes, but I'll come back to that in a moment. And you have to provide a diagnosis. The diagnosis has to specifically say that it, your new species differs from some other species in some particular way. That's it. It doesn't actually say anything really more than that. It doesn't say in what way it differs or what traits you're looking at or or how many traits it differs in, that is the freedom, that uh, taxonomic freedom that Ray referred to, is that it doesn't specify any constraints on what the diagnosis must say. Tomorrow, all of us between going between, uh, we'll have lizard examples, frog examples, bird examples, plant examples, you will see in different groups what the criteria are used as a best practice 
but the code itself doesn't specify what type of characters you must be looking at for a particular group of organisms. So here is the diagnosis here, but then we'll get back to what the sort of best practices are tomorrow. So one of the things that you should all know, and we're going to talk more about online resources later today, is that the codes are online. And so within zoology, we refer to it as the ICZN or just simply the, the code. And so the code is easily browsable online. So if you go to the site, you can actually get every single chapter, every single piece of information that is required for having proper taxonomic names. So this is not something that you have to you know, write down from even this lecture. You can actually go and browse it yourself. It's admittedly sometimes a little cumbersome, but there is even a search function where you can search for you know, nomen dubium, and it'll give you the relevant pieces of the code that refer to that. So this is what that looks like. And then I'm just going to highlight a few pieces here and just kind of reiterate some of what Eric said. So these are pieces of the code referring to species group names. So um, there has to be one word of at least two letters, and it has to be formed properly. And this afternoon, I believe, we'll be, or maybe after break, we'll be talking about an exercise about, you know, how do you make the names, quote, pr proper names. And it also has to be explicitly denoted as a new name, all right, as I just said. So availability, in order for the name to be available, it has to be published with a description that refers to type specimens, and that description has to say that it's different from some other named species. It actually probably wouldn't count, I have to think about this, if you said it differed from a species that didn't already have a name, right? You're, you're referring to other taxa, named taxa, and how it differs from those. Um, and we just kind of had a little short discussion about this in the questions, but the name not only must be formed correctly, that's all that matters. It just matters that it's formed correctly and meets the criteria. It doesn't matter that it's a good name. That, for instance, I mean, we have all sorts of examples of this where um, uh, one of my favorite examples in North America is something called the tailed frog. The most unique and interesting piece of biology about this frog is that males have essentially a penis on them, right? No frogs have a structure like that. This is what this frog is famous for. Its name refers to the fact that it doesn't have a spade on its foot, pretty much just like all other frogs. The reason, it was described from a single female, right? And so the person that got the information in the beginning really didn't have that much information. They gave it a name. The name is sort of not a very good, good name because it's not really describing anything about this organism. But yet, it's still a valid name, right? And we, you can imagine cases where you, know, you catch a brown bird and you think it's a new species, you give it a new name, and then it turns out it's the only brown specimen that's ever been recorded of an otherwise red bird, right? It doesn't matter. You know, if the name is Brunius and refers to it being brown, because basically every single individual is red, doesn't make any difference, the name is still Brunius. What would you have named this Sorry? What would you have named this I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. Like, what would you do? Uh, just because, you know, at the time, the only evidence you had was that, in this uh, case, a scaphus uh, was a female and it didn't have a spade on its foot. I guess that's what you'd name it. I don't know. But it's, uh, I like that example, you know. So um, availability and validity are two different things. So the valid name is the name that we use right now. When we go out and we're identifying frogs or birds or plants in the forest next week, when we give them the scientific names, hopefully, the names that we'll be using is the valid name, the currently used name and recognized name for that taxon. Availability just simply means that it meets all of the criteria to be a scientific name as of you know, the time of publication of that name. So what would be an example of an available name that wasn't valid? Does anyone have an example? Most common examples are junior synonyms, right? It's an available name, it's a real name, but it's not the valid name for that species. It's recognized as you know, a synonym, so it doesn't have priority because it was published later, right? and they're then recognized to be the same thing. So while it's available, it's not actually valid. So you have to explicitly specify now, not only specimens, that specimens exist, but also the collections they're deposited in. And so in the, throughout the 20th century, I can give examples of this from Africa, where species that we worked on we don't know where the type specimens are. Specimens are noted in the publication and thus make those names valid, right, or sorry, make the names available, 
and they are the valid names now, but actually I don't know where those specimens are. And so that's constantly a challenge for us, but just because I don't know what collection the type specimens are in doesn't mean that it's not an available name. So, but now we have to specify not only the specimens, but also say the collections where it's deposited. What I've put up and you'll just have when it's distributed as a PDF are just things that actually, in this case, are about the type specimens, how we take care of the types. And one thing I want to point out is that while these are not necessarily requirements, um, there's a lot of recommendations in the code, right? These are sort of best practices that are not yet required. And so some of these are actually really interesting because they pertain to the scientific collections that house the types, right? So for instance, the recommendation is that in, in collections, all of the types are specifically labeled that they are types and that collections know where the types are and that they're organized and they're unmistakably recognized as name bearing types. And they take all the necessary steps for preservation. So even the code makes recommendations to institutions about how they're supposed to care for these specimens that are so valuable for taxonomy. In my collection that we manage, we have all of the name bearing types are organized together in one little piece of the collection. The rest of the collection is organized by taxon, but in one little part of the collection it's just the name bearing types. So the turtles and the lizards and the frogs and the Sicilians are all in one little part. So we have the name bearing types organized. So in a sense we're following the recommendations of the code for these specimens. So I'm just uh, going to throw this up too. Um, uh, Dr. Foca mentioned a few of these, but I can kind of um, hopefully provide a little bit more detail on some like sin types. So the name bearing types are really just two primary things when we describe them the first time. They're the holotype, and that's when you only give one specimen, right? And thus all the rest of the type series in that paper are the paratypes or sin types. Now the code actually for animals recommends against using sin types. The reason is, is it creates confusion. So a lot of, uh, in older literature, we can have cases in which the syntype series contains more than one species, right? So that's a problem. And so in cases like that, a reason that a lectotype is designated is because one of those is taken to represent the name species, and then some of those other paralectotypes, they may not even be the same species, right? And so in order to con avoid confusion when you have more than one species in a syntype series, you restrict the name to just one of those and then the others become something else. So that's one of the values. It sounds a little esoteric to talk about syntypes and lectotypes, but the reason that we have them is that because sometimes in these series that all have equal status, they can have multiple species in them and then somehow we have to sort out, you know, what does the name actually apply to? And that's why we can have lectotypes, paralectotypes, allolectotypes, as uh, Eric mentioned. So name bearing types can be replaced and you have to fix a neotype, a new type specimen that bears the name. And unfortunately, this happens frequently. This happens because material is lost. It's just literally simply lost because collections don't know where their type material is. Sometimes they disappear into collections. Sometimes we have terrible cases like the museum in Milan where a uh, bomb during World War II was dropped in the museum and just uh, obliterated a lot of the collections. So in some of those cases, those species that were there and had type specimens there have to have you know, a new specimen uh, designated for reference. One thing that I just want to um, highlight at the very end is topotypes and what that means. So in general, a topotype doesn't have any name bearing status. It just means that it's a type specimen that came from the locality of the name bearing types. So of course the holotype is a topotype, right? It came from the same locality as a type locality because it is the type specimen. Paratypes can come from the type locality, the same one as the holotype, or they can come from a different locality. So those paratypes that came from the holotype locality are topotypes. But we can go collect specimens if there was a species in Corrup that was described from Corrup National Park, we can go and describe or collect new specimens and those are topotypes, right? They're from the same locality as the type locality, but they don't, they don't have any official status. They're useful. So a lot of times in, when we're trying to sort out the uh, identity of different species that are complicated, we want genetic material from the type locality. And so Rafe and I will purposefully go out of our way you know, to visit some random village somewhere because you know, 100 years ago someone was there and collected a frog. So we want to try and get 
uh, genetic data from that same place. Those are topotypes. They're very useful, but on their own, just because they're called type, it doesn't mean that they have any sort of a status. They weren't necessarily part of the original publication. Sometimes on museum collections, you can see things labeled as topotypes, and every once in a while you have museum collections that where people aren't that familiar with taxonomy and somehow those are included among the type material, uh, but they're not really type material. So uh, Eric talked a little bit about homonymy. And so one of the things just to note here is that, as Eric said, that animal, animal species can't have the same name, but you do find it a lot among animals, plants, and fungus. And so I also work with fossils. And so I just want to point this out that fossil animals also cannot have the same name as living animals, right? So there's a single code that is relevant to animals, whether or not they're extinct or alive, right? And so a lot of times within animals, we have these cases where the paleontology literature has a name that's actually the same, you know, there's a, I'm just making this up, a dinosaur that has the same name as a beetle. Well, one of those is a synonym, right? One of those has, sorry, not a synonym, one of those has priority as the senior homonym and one of them is the junior, right? So just because it's a dinosaur and a beetle, you know, that's still a problem. So um, this is even a problem within animals between the living and the extinct. And so this is just the last two slides before we break. Um, one of the more recent things that's happened within both the zoological and botanical nomenclature is electronic publications, right? So as you know, there's probably a lot of publications now that you'll see that are freely available online Right? They're open access, and this is a great thing for taxonomy and systematics. It sort of alleviates the problem that you have and we have about accessing key literature for species descriptions. Right? It's online, it's available, it's free. That's wonderful. The catch is that for many years the code said that a publication had to be widely distributed, and what that was taken to mean was that it was a paper journal, right? He mentioned the annals of the of, uh, University of Boya, and it was distributed to many different libraries around the world. And having that was basically the criterion to say that, OK, that publication has been widely distributed. It's in this museum. It's in that library. It's in this university. So it's a name that should be known by the community. Well, now, of course, the easiest way to distribute information is online. right? And there's a lot of journals that have no paper version. And so one of the things that's happened recently within um, Taxonomy is to move to some way of keeping track in an official form of these names that are published online. And so you can look at this more in your leisure, but I wanted to point it out because it is something that you'll see now. So for instance, within zoology, you'll see this referenced a lot, Zobank. And so what Zobank is, is it's essentially a, quote, registry of zoological nomenclature. And so sometimes you'll have a publication, even one that's actually in paper, that says this was an official act that was registered with Zobank and it'll give a number. And so you can go through here and actually find acts. Someone will say, this is a new species, that's a, an act. Or they'll say, this species is a synonym of this species, that's an act. They'll also list type localities, uh, holotype information, things like that here. And we'll show you this afternoon a lot of other databases that you can go to for particular groups of organisms to learn about, you know, the taxonomy, the synonyms, the type specimens, things like that. But this is a, this will become more and more important um, to us as a community in the coming 10 years. Uh, and just, I, I wrote a few notes on here and you can look at this when you have the PDF, but just as what this is intended to do, so it's a registry of nomenclature acts, it's a registry of the publications that actually make those acts, like they say this is a new species or this is a synonym. Um, the authors of those publications, the type specimens of those, and the idea here is that as we move more and more and more to electronic publication is to find a way to one, make those, um, the acts in those lasting, but also findable, right? So these acts may occur in many, many, many different journals and to have some sort of central depository of that really important taxonomic information. Uh, and so we'll show more of those databases and things like that later uh, today, I think. So that's it.